birth, aging, illness, death. These things present us with a lot of challenges. The body does things it never did before. And there's certain things it used to be able to do that it suddenly can't do. You find yourself thwarted. And the mind gets really frustrated if it hasn't been trained. This is why we have to train it in meditation. Otherwise, craving takes over, and we become slaves to our craving. It will bring us back to more birth, aging, illness, and death. Think of King Gauravya. He's had that conversation with Venerable Ratabala about why Ratabala had ordained. Ratabala had talked about the four Dhamma summaries that he had learned from the Buddha. The, the world is swept away, it does not endure. A teaching on inconstancy, aging. The world offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. The illustration there is of an illness where even a king can't say, now that I'm ill, and someone among my courtiers takes some of this pain away from me so I can feel less pain. Even kings can't be in charge of their pain. It's a teaching on, on suffering, stress. Both of those teachings are also teachings on non-self. In other words, this body that you thought would do what you wanted is suddenly not doing what you wanted anymore. The pain comes, and you can't share it out among others. There's a lot you cannot do around that. And then, of course, there's death. That's a third. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind one. It's nothing of its own. And then Rattavala asks the king, after he's been reflecting on his aging, illness, and death, if someone were to ask you if there's a kingdom to the east that you could conquer, would you want to conquer it? The king says, yes, of course. Another kingdom to the west, north, south, yes, yes, yes. How about a kingdom on the other side of the ocean that you could conquer? Would you try to conquer that? Yes. Craving knows no bounds. I remember a monk in Thailand who commented on that one time. It was an old monk who stayed at Wadasokaram. We were having our evening drink on the porch of the cellar. And this enormous Farang came with this tiny, tiny little Thai woman. He looked at them and he said, Craving knows no bounds. That's what you've got to watch out for. So you've got to train the mind to have a matter-of-fact attitude, both towards the good things and the bad things in life. As the Buddha said, you have to see their dangers, you see their lure, and you have to see the escape from them. This can seem obvious with, with the bad things. But to see the allure and see the, the drawbacks, and to see the escape requires that the mind be very, very neutral as it observes these things, very matter-of-fact. Not neutral in the sense of just allowing whatever is going to happen going to happen, but very observant, like a spy who wants to figure out the, the activities of the enemy. The spy has to be very matter-of-fact in watching them, otherwise the spy will send back misinformation. You've got to see, what is it about the things that age and grow ill and die? Keep pulling us back to them. And to some extent, it's the f their qualities in those things, and a lot, however, has to do with our own imaginations around them, which is why we have to develop this ability to be aware of something and see our perceptions around it, and see the thing and the perceptions as separate, and see our awareness as something separate, too. 
This applies to the good things in the meditation as well, and the path to get away, to find an escape. We're going to run into very subtle things that are really seductive. Insights come, and they seem so profound. And then we create a sense of self around the insight. We get stages of concentration, and we could develop a sense of self around that. Sometimes the sense of self is very pronounced, and other times it's lurking inside something else. So again, you have to have a matter-of-fact attitude when you've had a good insight. And John Lee recommends thinking, to what extent is this true, and to what extent is the opposite true? Again, on own would say, when you have a good insight, watch what happens in the mind next. It's reaction to the insight. The Buddha talks about a monk who's been meditating, is able to get past speculations of the past, speculations of the future, and then get past the feelings of pleasure in jhana and the feelings of neither pleasure nor pain in jhana, and then announce, I am at peace. I'm unbound. And it was just the fact that he says, has an I in there. That proclaims that he still has some, some clinging. And the ideal attitude is you see that there are these things, and then there's, there's a cessation of fabrications with regard to them. And then the Buddha said, you have to see the escape from that. Now imagine how difficult that's going to be. You see the sensation of fabrications. It's like everything comes crashing down, and something opens up. Anyone not, not latch on to that? This is where Sambhaya Manata comes in. These really great insights are going to come, and if the mind hasn't been trained to be very matter of fact about what happens, what it experiences, it's going to fall for that. So learn to develop a resilient awareness of things, a matter-of-fact attitude, both for good things and for bad things. In the beginning, you're going to have to start with the bad things. And matter-of-fact, again, it's not that you're going to just sit there and be with them and say, well, this is where I have to be. Nothing I can do about it. You're trying to figure things out. It's like the spy trying to figure out the movements of the enemy and to figure out what they mean. You have to be very observant. You can't jump to conclusions. And they will hold you in good stead. And John Cha has a passage where he talks about what apparently was an awakening experience. That happened three times. In each case, he didn't jump to any conclusions. He just said, what is this? Watched it. One of the reasons why, for some people, awakening is partial awakening is because they latch on to their passion, say, for the deathless, and their passion for the great insights that have risen. And then they have to learn how to let go of that attachment. It's very subtle and very strong. So when you have to let go even of really good things. All the more so for things that are unskillful. Notice that, yes, you do have these attachments, and try to look into why. And you're going to see some things about the mind that you don't like about yourself. And if you don't have a matter-of-fact attitude, you're going to cover them up. You won't be able to see. So there should be that sense of resilience that says, I can watch anything. Now, this will grow with the practice. This is what concentration is for, is to get the mind resilient. We practice it day in, day out, day in, day out, so it gets more and more its natural way of being. So it doesn't jump to conclusions. And it watches for the sake of understanding and then going beyond. 
had a student talk to me recently. She had undergone what apparently was a minor stroke. And she's had many illnesses. Many times when she thought she was going to die. But this was the scariest because her brain was not working. And then she was struck by, well, what do I do now? How can I access the states that I accessed before? And it was that fear that would have been, if she had died at that point, that would have been the big obstacle. The obstacle wouldn't have been the brain, it would have been the fear. And so you have to look at the fear. Even in a place like that, your body has stopped working. Your brain has stopped working. You're going to have to let go of any fear around that and just be very matter of fact. It's going to take a lot. But it can be done. We have the Achans as our evidence. We have the great disciples of the Buddha and then Buddha himself as our evidence. That as the body stops working, the mind doesn't have to get into a turmoil. Can accept these things with a matter of fact attitude and see the escape. There is this, there's there is these things happening. That's the attitude, the matter of fact attitude. And then beyond that, there's something beyond. So you take that there is this attitude for the sake of the escape. And we have the Buddha's evidence that, that we can be confident that there is an escape. As long as you can maintain that attitude of the patient observer. That when it sees it, something, it will say, oh, there is this. And we'll keep watching. <laughs>